everyone, and welcome to Discovery. Thank you for being here tonight. My name is Isolde. I'm one of the producers of this fine show. And uh, it is my privilege to introduce tonight's curator. Seth Rosenblatt has been a fellow since 2017. He's been involved in Odd Salon for longer than that, given several talks. Uh, he's often the event photographer, so you often see him behind the lens capturing amazing photos of people. But uh, he's a very talented storyteller, writer, journalist. Uh, I am so happy to have him here tonight to wrangle all of the cats of tonight's show. So without further ado, I'd like to introduce Seth. Please give him a big hand. Hello, everybody. I can't see anything. Just... Uh, clo it's close to a ship. It's very, very close to a ship. It's under a ship, in fact. Um, so uh, I'm thrilled to be here with you all tonight uh, as we journey through these discoveries into science and art, adventure, history. Oh, oh, you guys are so slow. Let's try that again. Let's try that again. So we're going on a little journey tonight through discoveries into science. Oh, God, you make me happy. Thank you. Uh, art, adventure... Art, good, adventure, okay, okay, that's good. Yeah. Ooh. Ah, now you all can see. <laughs> ah. uh, and sometimes we're doing all of these topics at once. Um, and thank you again to Isolder for that very kind introduction. Uh, I'm Seth Rosenblatt, I'll be curating for the evening. Um, before we dive into some of the weirdest, most impactful discoveries uh, our fellow humans have made, we have some other fellow humans to thank. So I'd like to thank uh, everyone who contributed to our pre-show silent auction upstairs uh, and to Colin and Arthur for organizing it. I hope some of you uh, will walk away tonight with those incredible pieces and five gallons of beer. I mean, how could you not want to do that? Uh, and a big thank you to this evening's volunteers who make the show go. Uh, John Adams, the man behind our high-quality video and YouTube channel. Uh, Alexander and Marcus, our talented photographers. Uh, my brothers behind the camera. And everyone who has been working merch and door. Uh, I believe it's uh, Matt, Michelle, and Natalie. I'm sorry if I forgot anyone. Uh, and I'd be remiss without thanking our fearless cat herding leaders who've shepherded Odd Salon into this, our sixth year. It's insane. Uh, Aneta, Trey, Tamar, and Asolda. And. Come on. All right. And most importantly, I want to thank you all for joining us tonight. We don't get to do this without you. And I'm absolutely serious about this. This is something that is dependent on you all showing up and showing us some love. Which brings me to how you can become one of us. Okay. So you can join us on our adventure into the odd corners of whatever stuff, things. There are several ways you can do this. Uh, you can become a member. Go to oddsalon.com slash membership to sign up. And as a member, you get a warm, fuzzy feeling somewhere above your navel, um, maybe not as high as your esophagus, knowing that you've helped us put together these incredible shows. Uh, you also get discounted tickets to upcoming salons and insider access to extracurricular Odd Salon activities. Uh, so far this year, we've had a fun tour of uh, North Beach map magicians Shine and Shine. And uh, our fellow and one of tonight's speakers, Kate O'Donnell, took us on a behind-the-scenes adventure at the Exploratorium. And if you've never seen all the craziness that goes into making the new Exploratorium work, you are missing out. It's bonkers. I love it. And it's filled with tons of science. science. And, and ships, actually. Uh, Kate, there's really nothing like helping to catalog glass jars found in 150-year-old latrines. I mean, it's, it's remarkable. Um, our next adventure is a full-day excursion to the uh, Rosicrucian Park on April 28th. Uh, sign up to be a member today. 
Uh, one of the coolest things about Odd Salon uh, is that we actively, and you know, depending on who you're talking to, aggressively uh, seek out new speakers for our stage. This stage, right here. Odd, Odd Salon is a participatory project by design. So if you have a story you'd like to share, and you'd like to speak, go to oddsalon.com slash speak and send in your ideas. We are currently accepting submissions for spite. I am sure some of you have some spiteful stories to tell. Uh, and you can join our email list uh, to find out about upcoming themes and our brainstorming sessions. 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 <laughs> Why not? Let's add sessions to the list. Uh, we have an open discussion group on the Faceborgs called Something Weird. Uh, we post speaker's notes there. We post follow-ups to previous talks, teases of upcoming talks, anything, really, that's relevant to our pursuit of the strange corners of history. And although some of us are in fancy attire for the evening, this is not the symphony. Keep your phones out. Please tweet and gram and share your thoughts on tonight's show. Before we get started, and you're going to have to raise your hands, maybe do a little jig, uh, whose uh, first Odd Salon is tonight? Yeah! Look at all of you. I presume there's a lot of you because I can hear you. I, I can't see anything. Um, so uh, some cults you may be familiar with will you know, draw red lipstick Vs on your foreheads, but what I want from you all is a different form of participation. Hey. Here's how we do. Tonight, we will be sharing six true short tales of discovery. Things that should not be in science. <laughs> of ancient surgical techniques. Of archaeological adventure. Of whole cities lost and discovered again. Ooh, I like it. <laughs> and entire continents discovered before you thought they were. And yes, discoveries of the beer kind. Beer. Oh, I'm so glad to hear Egan talk. <laughs> Speaking of, we absolutely positively have an intermission so you can refill your glass once or thrice, whatever. Thrice. Our speakers are experts and enthusiastic amateurs. Please be generous with your applause. And this, as I have alluded to, is not a quiet event. Please make some noise so our speakers know they are loved. Here's how it works, and if you've been here before, Help out. Yes. Ooh. Ships on fire. That's right. Fire. On fire. That's right. Uh, here's one that, that some of us really want to see added. Um, we're having some difficulties, so hopefully all of you here will, will really uh, uh, take to it. Fire. Maps on fire. Good. All right. All right. Maps with holes and on fire, sure. All right. And I've been, everything, oh God, everything's on fire. It's so true, it's so true. Um, one, one quick uh, housekeeping note before I forget, there's a few reserve seats up in the front. If you are planning to sit in a reserve seat, if you have paid for a reserve seat, uh, get there now, uh, because after my invocation, we will be opening them up to everyone else, because we have an incredibly full house tonight, and thank you again so much, everyone, for showing up. All right. And so, on to our theme. Discovery. Who doesn't like discovering things? Well, for all of its grandeur, and maybe because of it, California is a land of discovery, but it is also the unfortunate history of being newly discovered time and again, and often in ways that are quite horrific. Uh, and I'm not talking about what's happening to us here and now. Uh, when the Spanish finally made it to California in 1542, uh, they named the land California after a mythical island from a popular novel of the time, which was populated only by black Amazon warriors who coincidentally used gold tools and weapons. Uh, little did the Spanish know that these women weren't mythical, but uh, in Africa and not America. Uh, when the Spanish began their California conquest in 1769, that's right, it took them 200 years to figure out what to do, 
Uh, California was arguably the most linguistically and ethnically diverse region of native North America. Uh, if this happened today, we might be living in the great state of Wakanda. Uh, and not unlike Silicon Valley and its boom that consumes us now, uh, the history of our home hinges on the high cost of discovery and how coincidences like really shitty food uh, can change everything. Uh, 80 years after the Spanish established the Presidio at San Diego, a woman named Elizabeth Jenny Cloud Wimmer found herself with her husband and seven kids, that must have hurt, um, at what would become Sutter's Mill. Apparently, she was a cranky, difficult person to be around who could have known with seven children, uh, demanding that the men hired to build John Sutter's sawmill eat when she had prepared food. She grew irate at them if they weren't promptly seated at mealtimes. Uh, one account I found said she was pregnant at the time, but being a hardy woman of the West, that could hardly account for her temperament. Uh, and shockingly, she served the best portions to her husband and children. The tragedy of it all. Anyway, the workers were mostly a mix of the uh, Nisena and Maidu, local Native Americans, more on that in a minute, and the Mormons who were fresh out of the Mexican-American War and stuck in California. The Mormons rebelled against Wimmer and her kitchen table manners just after Christmas and insisted on building their own living quarters from where they would prepare their own food. So even proto-Californians were food snobs. <laughs> uh, the delay caused by, their build by building their cabin led, not surprisingly, to a delay in the construction of John Sutter's mill. While an attempt to change the direction of the river at the top of the mill was completed successfully, the bottom part had yet to be finished. James W. Marshall, who was hired by John Sutter to run the mill, decided to open the gates at the top uh, during the night when there was no risk to the workers. This is not because uh, uh, Marshall actually cared about any of the workers. He just wanted the mill done so that he and Sutter could start making money from it. Little did he know. Uh, so on or around the morning of January 24th, 1848, when Marshall was inspecting the work the natural flow of the river had done overnight, he discovered gold flakes. Uh, gold! If you want to shout out gold tonight, you are more than welcome to. And, you know, not surprisingly, the uh, uh, gold flakes are the inspiration for Harvey Goldtinger tonight. Go get yours at the merch table. They're running out. But to confirm the discovery, uh, Marshall and some of the mills paid workers applied science. science. Thank you. They pounded the gold flat. They coated it in nitric acid. They reproduced Archimedes' test for determining the density of gold. And even Wimmer dunked some of it in her boiling pot of lye as she made soap. Uh, soap, not soup. Strangely, and I didn't know this until I started researching uh, this invocation. This was actually the second time that gold was discovered in California. The first being six years earlier and 35 miles northeast of Los Angeles. But because of the limited mining methods, seriously, they were throwing dirt in the air, letting the wind blow the dirt away, and then let the heavier gold dust fall back to earth. <laughs> Pure science, science or something. They had limited sources of gold, they had limited economic vision, and limited communication. This first gold rush produced at a high estimate about $100,000 in five years. It's not even a, you know, non-tech salary. <laughs> you compare that to the gold rush of 1848, which is estimated to have produced $750 million in 17 years. And yeah, the picture up there, it's not even close. So the discovery of gold at Sutter's Mill at Coloma on this map, that's sort of in the center there, uh, changed the world. It spurred innovations in mining techniques and inspired gold rushes in Australia, Canada, Colorado, and Nevada's Comstock load of silver. Uh, because of its population boom, California leapfrogged into statehood, and the sleepy village of Yerba Buena became a city made of ships. Thank you. The flood of fortune seekers led to agricultural growth to feed them and accelerated the need to link the Atlantic and Pacific by rail. Uh, what? Oh, graves, okay. Trains, 
We can do tra trains or graves. It wound up with both. Um, the gold miner and historian Hubert Howe Bancroft wrote the discovery of gold, of the discovery of gold in California. It tingled the, in the ear and at the finger ends. It buzzed about the brain and tickled the stomach. It warmed the blood and swelled the heart. New fires were kindled on the hearthstones. New castles builded. He, he wrote builded, I checked, it's weird. Um, <laughs> in the air. If Satan from Diablo's peak had sounded the knell of time, if a heavenly angel from the Sierra's height had heralded the millennial day, if the blessed Christ himself had risen from that ditch and proclaimed to all mankind amnesty, their greedy hearts had never half so thrilled. <laughs> Glad you like that. You just can't get to ground truth without consequences. The Native American populations were decimated by the gold diggers and by Sutter specifically. Before the United States claimed California, Sutter was the Mexican representative in charge of the Native American relations with Mexico in the Sacramento Valley. Uh, he decided to build his sawmill because a measles epidemic wiped out most of his Native American slaves, whom he would often lend out to other r white ranchers to build goodwill among neighbors, except the people who were there before you. One account from the time said that Sutter even kept a group of Native American women as sex slaves in a room off of his main office. Uh, the guy was pretty horrific. Uh, he fed his Native Americans awful from food troughs without plates or utensils, which is quite an irony given the later uprising spurred by Jenny Wimmer's cuisine. While some accounts say that Sutter only mistreated Native Americans from groups who fought with the local Nisan and Maidu, uh, who were often conscripted into his personal militia, or from otherwise faraway communities, that's some small consolation if true. It's pretty clear that Sutter was a horrific bastard. The discovery of gold in California led directly to the genocide of its native populations. In only one generation, we're talking about 20 years, 80% of California's Native American populations were decimated by disease, by displacement, by blatant murder. Remember those 90 Native American languages I talked about up at the top of this? Well, fewer than half of those languages now exist. Uh, Ms. Wimmer, who struggled over her hot stove, claimed the nugget of gold given to her by James Marshall for herself. It eventually ended up in the Bancroft Library at UC Berkeley. But despite their discovery, Sutter and Marshall would not endure. They both died in poverty, and not before uh, Sutter would see his Native American slaves and workers abandon him, his ranch destroyed, his wealth stolen, and his lands granted by the Mexican government revoked by the great state of California. <laughs> Apparently, the internet age motto, don't be a dick, rings true back through the centuries. <laughs> so a note on discovery. It's not just our theme for tonight, but it's really part of our DNA here at Odd Salon. Uh, it's a building block we return to often. These accidents of fate often occur only because the people doing the discovering have sufficient experience to make the leaps necessary to get about their discovery. The cost of discoveries is often undervalued, perhaps because of their accidental nature. Historian H.W. Brands takes a stab at it in tonight's uh, speaker's book, The Age of Gold, first noting that the global impact of the gold rush triggered the most astonishing mass movement of peoples since the Crusades, and then concluding in his introduction. None of those who traveled to California in search of gold had any inkling before January 24th, 1848, of what was in store for them. Their lives, about to become threads in a grand, a golden tapestry, were still distinct, wound on spindles separated by oceans and continents and gulfs of culture and mountain ranges of history. And they would have remained distinct in nearly all cases if not for James Marshall's discovery. But starting on that day, a powerful engine, the engine of fate, or perhaps merely of human nature, began winding them all in. So let's raise our glasses. Let's raise our glasses. And for the first time this evening, to discoveries of fate and discoveries of human nature. And as fate would have it, all right, fate has nothing to do with it. 
We've chosen stellar, uh, six stellar speakers for you tonight. Egan Hervella, Kate O'Donnell, Dan Von Hoyle, Diraj Korwani, Mark Wilson, who will be giving his first ever talk from our stage. Bless his cotton socks. And returning for her second talk, and first up, Audrey uh, Bogokwal has a timely tale that will get you right in your dinosaur bones. Give Audrey a warm welcome, everyone, and thank you. <laughs> 